The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Every civilization had a prophecy of the end times. From the Native Americans, the Egyptians, the Hebrews, even the Islamic people around the world, all of them had prophecies. And they're very similar. These prophecies are quite similar in certain aspects. For one, all of them agree, all of them agree that people are going to turn against their government. This would begin with a change in the people. If you go and search any prophecy out there from any civilization, you're going to find that all of them prophesy the change in humanity. That here it is, that, that men would be like women and women would be like men. Why is that important? Well, as you know, the mindset of that culture, that civilization, they always reach a specific point of development right before they fall apart. Now, let me ask you this. Who created humanity? Who did that? Anybody know? The father did, of course. We don't know his method. It is said throughout many different cultures that uh, he had his angels employed in, in so doing. Which means we're all made in a very similar fashion. When civilizations first began, because they want to establish things, all of them had some sort of deity. All of them did. They all sought to obey that deity and to appease that deity. As the years progress, the same way a baby is born, just like a baby develops in the womb, and they go through, you know, trimesters, different stages of development, and the womb changes as the baby grows, right? The womb changes as the baby grows, just like the earth changes as humanity grows. So think of a trimester of a baby being about possibly 1,400 years for humanity. We go through different eras in our development where we deal with different things, right? Where we develop different things. So it always goes like this. They always begin from some sort of disaster that they can perceive they went through. Somebody writes about those disasters and warns future generations. Then more generations are born. And they begin to get away from the fear of that disaster that happened that they're not clear about. And they begin to go forward into cultivating everything they can cultivate. One thing they develop, it, because food becomes a major priority, is they develop crops. From crops, they develop management of those crops and trade. From that trade, humanity expands. Once you can feed large groups of people, once you have some sort of delivery method and production method for large groups of people, they grow. Well, once they have the food, they start going to housing. They begin to develop clever ways uh, for housing to make themselves comfortable. Then they have politics or government. They start to fight. They start to resolve how they're going to govern everybody. And all the while, they're going through the change of ideology, seeing what is real and what is not. They entertain all aspects of faith. This takes many different generations, right? Just like in the USA, we had the witch hunts and some more things. Uh, there were other things in other cultures. The same thing was happening. Mankind was developing. And it seems to be the same way every single time. Then we get into the where everybody is fed. Most people have housing. Then you have the com competition, right? You also have development. So this competition breeds fighting, right? It breeds fighting. Now, fighting requires very innovative ways to make weapons, and manufacturing weapons is quite important. So what do they do? They, begin to, they become competitive, right? This is when we get into free markets, right? Capitalism, things of that nature. They begin to, they begin to allow that to develop. They even promote that to develop because competition breeds the best possible solution for everybody. So they have humanity compete against each other to produce the best weapons. And that trickles on to be the best development of, of crops. You know, everything is being developed until we start working with the metals in the earth, making things a little more robust than usual. Right? Once they get to a specific point of development, they go into this high-tech 
area of development. Now, by this time, civilizations have worked out quite a bit. They know about each other. They begin to, you know, set up global standards, this, that, and the other. Just like we had global trade a long time ago. They found this with the Egyptians. All the Egyptian finds all over the world, all these maps that are quite uh, accurate, right? We're not talking about maps that are on some, some written on leather somewhere. No, no, no. The other finds, right? Keep in mind, when, when things burn up here on the earth, all the materials that we use right now, like for example, we use plastics. If the world were to catch on fire, nobody's going to find these plastics. The only thing that's going to be found are those things we have etched in stone or preserved somehow deep in the earth in something else, right? So if something were to happen, catastrophic, where things burned up on the surface of the earth, nobody would ever know we had computers. Nobody would ever know what's written down on paper. Nobody would ever know what we have stored uh, as far as digital data. The only things that would survive are these deep layer data centers. Think about that. Deep layer data centers. But nobody would know how to access them. That would take time to develop something to even recognize that, hey, these are, these are, these are data centers. You know, somebody was saying this, this has to be data, right? Well, same thing we do today. That's why you have this uh, secret archaeology. They find things like this. They don't share it with you. Right? They find devices that were used a long time ago right? that are deep down in the earth. They didn't burn. They were somewhat preserved deep down in the earth, and they spend time trying to, trying to uh, find the correct engineering methods to extract information from them. Right? They have found devices, handheld devices. They have found uh, uh, tools for doctors, tools for some machine that would manufacture. They have found this stuff before. Right? It's deep down in the earth and it never burned up yet. Everything else obliterated as expected. Now, that means you have, that brings up all the secrecy nonsense. I'll say stuff. Anyway, we continue to develop in the culture that we have right now. Now, everybody is hungry for information, right? In fact, information drives society. Why? Because we become bored so quickly. Stay with me on this. We become bored if we have nothing exciting to look at. We become bored. We've seen everything. See, at first, it begins with a hunger, and people start learning things. Then we develop devices where everybody can learn things. Everybody gets used to the devices. And they begin to learn, and over the, over the course of years, they know a little bit about everything. Until you reach this level where everybody knows what everybody knows. During that time, a real boredom and pointlessness of life settles in. So what do people do? They become iniquitous, highly iniquitous. Once the information learning, once the, once the oohs and ahs go away over the technology, once entertainment becomes... Um, uh, you know, quite methodical, boring, and just every, it's because it's so available, it's no longer exciting, right? Once all this happens, humanity becomes highly iniquitous because they always have to search for something exciting. Always. Even in your lives, you're Christians, you're believers, if you don't have something exciting, you can almost go nuts. And you know that. Anybody ever been sitting around and You've seen everything, you've watched every video, you've read just about every book, and you're sitting there like, oh, what do I do? I have nothing to do. And so you find yourself doing these repeat tasks, thinking about things, right? You ever find yourself like that? And then you're drawn back to go search the Internet for something exciting, something to get you excited, something to make you feel alive again. Don't worry about it. I already know some of these secrets about many folks. That's what people do, right? They hit that boredom stage. Kids do it too. They stay locked into video games where they can develop a brand new world, make it whatever they want. At any rate, people start doing this stuff, they will eventually burn out on it. There's only so much excitement you can give a person. And when this happens, when the burnout happens, and it's happening right now, right? People start getting this sensation. Where they can't be fulfilled. They've, they've already searched everything. Nothing is exciting. And that always begins. You guys remember the earthquake that they had in Turkey? You remember that? Where all those people died. 
And we talked the, uh, about one night, and I told you that it'll fade as though that earthquake never happened. Remember how impactful it was at that moment? Everybody was like, wow, that was horrible. That never happened before. And I told you guys, that would fade as though it never took place. And nobody would think about that earthquake in a few months. Didn't it happen that way? Even right now, you can remember the earthquake, but there's no feeling behind it. Come on now, stay with me. There's no feeling behind it. You have information and zero feelings behind it. There's no excitement. There's no surprise. There's no anything. Because now when you learn something extraordinary, you may get excited for a few moments, but instantly. So you've been through this routine so many times. You burn out quicker and quicker. You learn something interesting. You see it. You learn it. It's exciting at first. It could mean other things. And then it starts to die the very next day. It just begins to die. It's not that you're purposely ignoring it. You're just numb to it. You become numb to all excitement. You become numb to entertainment. This happened with movies. What do you think Hollywood really did what they did? This writer's nonsense. Do you really believe that? They needed something to cause people to appreciate Hollywood again so they could put movies back in the theaters so that actors could be paid. Let me give you guys a real story. Didn't you notice that actors, actors, they were going broke? Do you guys remember that? Netflix pops up, everybody can watch what they want, right? People started selecting movies that Hollywood didn't direct everybody to. All these streaming movie services started making more money than cable did. Do you guys remember that? And it was so bad that the phone companies now, they offered high-speed internet, and that's where they made their money. Anyway, people were going to streaming media, watching whatever they wanted, binge-watching everything because they could. Well, while they were doing that, Hollywood lost power and money and everything else. And so all of a sudden, they conjured up this idea with the Writers Guild. Do you remember that? some threat against Hollywood, something that was... Because you had actors on television, on the news, talking about bankruptcy, talking about going broke, talking about being famous, having mansions with no money. When you start seeing them on commercials for cereal, something has really gone wrong, correct? So that's what you... That's what ended up happening. And so they had this writer's problem. And the writer's gone strike. Well, that captured everybody's attention because people like drama. And they said, hey, the writers are on strike. Well, why? Because of, you know, whatever reason. And that lasted for a little while, but it gained the world's attention. And when no movies came out, and they also at the same time when they went on strike, they cut back. They were fighting all these streaming services in court, so they could not release all the movies they wanted to release. You may not have known that part. You can see it, though. It's, you know, it's free. It's on the Internet. So the selection went down. And nothing new came out. They did that on purpose. Nothing new came out. All of a sudden they said, hey, we're going to resolve the writer's thing and so new movies can come out. Everybody was hooked on it by then, right? And when it was over, the world celebrated. The world began to talk about it on social media. They said, oh, we got them. This is good. And so they put movies. They promised to put movies back in streaming services. But where did they go? They went to the theaters. Remember that? And all of a sudden, all those theaters that lost money because nobody was ever coming, what did they do? They built them back up again. What do you see in your town now again? Movie theaters, right? They're telling people, go to the theater, get the popcorn. They got the new chairs and this, that, and the other. But the problem is people burn out too much. Now, that's going to work for about another two months, and then people are going to burn out again. And when they burn out this time, the newer technology will be in place and you'll have over a million channels to access from but it takes AI to do it but that's another conversation do you see what happened people are not engaging and they know it politics is the same way when Clinton was in power people started getting into politics Obama was in power more people got into politics right um, when Trump was in power, lots of people were involved in politics. Lots of people are involved in politics. And so that's where the core 
of the dramas coming from. Wherever you look, they have to feed you. Hear me on this. Wherever you look, they're going to feed you. Why are they feeding you? Because if you were to ever draw back, if anybody ever drew back and refused to participate in this entertainment nonsense, in these arguments and the drama stew of the day, you would see the world for what it is and your head would hang low. And then you would begin to cry, my brothers and sisters, come out of that hypnotic place. Step in to reality. Get out of this show they're putting on for you on a daily basis. Get out of it. That's what you would say. You would say, back away. See, people who watch television, right, who have to have entertainment going in their homes, it's very difficult to break away. Don't ever, you know, point your finger at anybody who cannot leave entertainment alone. It's a lifeline. Do you know what happens if the TV shut off? The suicide rate goes up. Why? Because people begin to see reality. And they're not going to like it. They won't like it. Do you know that? They will not like it. They'll be forced to look at reality. They'll be forced to see how silly it is to live life in these days, in this world. They'll begin to see what we thought was really important is in fact a non-subject in the first place. And to see the truth is shocking. And it causes people's lives to become pointless. Many cannot draw upon Christ like you do. For you guys who believe Christ has given you purpose, the Word of God has given you great purpose because there's a great need in the world to fill this spiritual gap, right? A great need. But a person outside of a relationship with Christ does not have that. They're constantly searching for something to keep them alive. Because if they don't have it, they feel dead inside. That's why people are, are turning to pharmaceuticals even more and more now than ever before. Why? Because life is empty. When you sit back and you look at life at what it is, it's an empty, dark place where people walk in circles and pretend they're excited about things. It's based on show business. It really is. It's based on a show. Do you hear me, folks? Life has become based on a show. Now in civilizations, the same thing happened. And then people started feeling so bad inside. They said, nothing is fulfilling. The lusts of my flesh. And I'm not talking about adultery lust. That's in there too. But I'm talking about that entertainment hunger people have. That, that hunger to see something exciting. Nothing fed it. No subject fed it. You guys remember the UFO subject around 2012? How excited you guys were getting about the UFO topic. The, the potential of disclosure things. It got you really excited and engaged. You felt like there was a point to life. With these weird subjects, it's okay. You don't have to hide it. I already know. And people got excited. They got this feeling in, in dreams that they can't express to folks. Huh? Think about something. You ever have a dream that gives you a feeling that you have never had again? It gives you a feeling that you can't describe. It's a feeling that's strange. It's weird. It felt pleasing to the body, this, that, and the other. You, you do realize this all has been written down in journals from thousands of years ago. You're not the only one to go through it. It's a process of the flesh. The flesh has to be fed. That's why they have sports. Tell people if they were to shut down all sports activity, you think that would affect the people? Yes, it would. It would cause them to fight each other. It is very difficult to cage the flesh. There are experts who don't believe in Christ. They are indeed experts in the flesh, just like their daddy Satan. They know what's in the flesh and what's required to appease the flesh. Their job is to appease your flesh every single day. They do it through the system they have developed that is for your flesh. Television entertainment is for your flesh. The way the world is constructed is for your flesh. Even reward and penalty ratios are for your flesh. Because even Rome found out when the lusts of the flesh are not exercised, people will turn against everything around them. And then something wonderful happens. They burn out on sin itself. But before that happens, they become just like Sodom and Gomorrah. But 
this brings me to another point now once everything burns out like what's happening now politics engages people it allows people to fight in other words listen this is the important part it allows them to engage by way of their flesh because it gives them someone to fight it gives that natural spirit that dark thing in the flesh something to fight something to devour something to act against the aggression that's in the flesh must be exercised it must be and they know this in the world it must be exercised see as a christian as a christian you grow spiritually and can subdue all things of your flesh. But you know and I know the flesh, the spirit of the flesh is still strong. Even when you believe. All the apostles knew it. Jesus warned us about it. Prophets. He pointed that out many times. We know it for real. It has a hunger for those things in the world. It does not hunger for the Father. It hungers for immediate things. It has an appetite for violence and trauma. It has an appetite to fulfill itself on anything it can fulfill itself on. That's why people get attitudes when they're hungry. That's coming from their flesh. When you're walking by your flesh, you get attitudes when you're hungry. That's a fact. And after you feed yourself, only then is the body satisfied. And it feels like you're free to engage back what you were going to engage in. Fasting is very important. Because it cuts off. It, it, you refuse to feed your flesh. And when it starts cutting up, you have an option. If you're going to stand that fast, your flesh is going to have to be subdued. You know what happens when you fast? And your flesh is trying to give you an attitude because it's starving. When you go forward spiritually, you have a boom. You have a growth spurt spiritually. And a blossoming of strength spiritually that you never thought you had. It takes suffering for that to happen. That does not happen any other way. It takes a moment where you have to deny the flesh of what it wants. And you have to have your way, your path made in the name of the Lord in righteousness. And then when you stay on that path, your spirit will outgrow your flesh. And when that takes place, you have subdued your flesh in that area. And when that takes place, your flesh will stop hungering, period. Now, we're not talking about science. This, this is far beyond science. And what I'm telling you is this. If you go back and read your Bibles, right, you're going to hear this term, and I hungered not during the fast. That's what you're going to hear. How can you not be hungry during a fast? They were not. These people that went through multiple fasts, they did not hunger in the fast. What does that mean? That means once you subdue the lusts of your flesh, you're free. You're not free. And you have to constantly contend with your body. And a lot of people these days, they say, well, you know, that's impossible. Well, it's impossible to them because they've never taken all the steps. They've never seen it through. You can be hungry, malnourished, but your spirit can't subdue the flesh and your hunger will cease. Imagine being hungry for five, six, seven days. All of a sudden, you're not hungry anymore. I mean, not at all. And your body is not weak and famished and all this stuff. That's not what your body is. Your body strengthens itself. Like a bad child who's been corrected, it stands up again. Think about that. You see, a lot of people don't go to those steps because what you do must be done in righteousness. Not to try and see if something works. It must, you have to have that point founded in righteousness. Then when you start undergoing those steps, you will, you will experience how the flesh is subdued. Once it's subdued, that's when anger can all the get back in you again. Isn't that even thirst? You know, you can go out many days. If you're in the wild, you can go many days without food, but you can't go two or three days without water. That's a lie. People have lived it. How in the world can a person not eat or drink anything for 40 days. That's impossible, isn't it? Isn't that impossible? Yes, it's impossible, right? According to modern standards. But we know they did it. 
We know Jesus did it. We know that others did it in the Bible. We know that's not impossible. Let me give you a hint on something, something that was written back in the days of Abraham. Do you know there was a, there was a process where a person would lock themselves inside of this stone casing. Listen to me. They would have nothing with them. They would sit inside that stone casing for I believe it was 12 days. 12 days of exercising all the spirits of the flesh out. Nobody was coming to get you out. It was almost living near death. 12 days in the darkness. 12 days with no food, no water. 12 days, no human contact. 12 days, no nothing. It is said at the end of the 12th day, the light of the spirit comes forward and the entire chamber lights up by the human body. By the way, th these are not pagan writings. These are writings nobody ever wants you to have because they don't want you to know those stories. But it would light up that person. And from that point, that person's access to their inheritable right was made. At the end of the matter, they would open up the case and the person's body would be totally renewed. Totally renewed. This is not pagan practices. No. This is found in, only in the Hebrew culture. They didn't want people to know this. You know, they have things right now of disciplines. And that's what's missing. In a lot of cultures right now is discipline. People desire to have the spirit, but they're not willing to have the discipline to stand up spiritually. Do you think God would just endow a person with power if that person had no discipline? It takes discipline to reach your full potential. Discipline is more than just saying yes. Discipline is having the resolve to continue with that yes, right? To do what's necessary, even to the point of death itself. In other words, that discipline is to say yes to the Lord no matter what it would cost you. Those who commit to such things certainly do see the glory of the Most High. But they've taken all that away and so they have people searching for righteousness. And they're not teaching people the truth. They're likely giving them the word so that a person can never reach that full potential. And every single believer knows. They know that something is held back and they don't know what it is. How sneaky. How sneaky. It's like a fast. When a person fasts, what are they fasting for? And by what standard? Seriously. Another element to the storm. You guys on the East Coast right now have a, I have a whole chain of alerts going for the East Coast right now. Tornadoes, not even connected to this storm, not to the main storm, are starting to spin off in the Carolinas. They're starting to spin off in Virginia. They're starting to spin off in West Virginia. They're starting to spin off in Pennsylvania, right? So make sure you guys, you, you, you take heed to those warnings, okay? And do that. Take heed to those warnings. Anyway, anyway, discipline is important. You know, I've been diagnosed with death, you could say, at least five or six times. Where they said, uh, you're not going to make it. You got four months left. You got six months left. Or you have two months left. You guys know that. Right now, in my brain, there's no way I should have these cognitive abilities. Every x-ray shows the exact same thing. Every x-ray. And they have no answer for it either. Nor can they do anything about it. If you had something uh, a little bigger than a uh, golf ball in your brain that showed up on all x-rays, almost like a void with some hard growth. And it was, it was, it caused your problems at first, but then all of a sudden it's nothing. It didn't give me, you know, something like that would certainly cause neurological issues and things of that nature, right? Cognitive issues, whatever. It would cause those problems. Nothing. Do you think a person who's been diagnosed with bone marrow cancer, a cancer in the bone marrow, would, uh, and, and this is what, year eight? You think that would happen three times? Why would cancer just leave all by itself? Why would certain conditions? But I thought I was done for wonder breathing in all that oil. It sent me into a 
conniption fit for about four weeks one time. But during the worst suffering I ever had, I realized something. This life that I have is not mine. It's not mine. See, I happen to be a believer. And as a believer, I happen to know I have a creator. I also happen to know I'm not here to do what the flesh wants to do or whatever I dream of. If I'm sent here, then I needed to find the one who sent me here and what that one desired of me to fulfill it. Because surely if you make a cup, it's made to carry contents. A cup is not a fork. If you wake up and to finally realize you're a fork, then you'd realize, well, I don't carry anything. I pierce, entangle, and hold on to, right? The only way you would find that out is to find out who your creator actually is. Having gone through many different things, I did not want the phony baloney belief. I didn't want to be one of those who said, I believe in the Lord, yet I'm doing my own thing in the world, right? Using scripture and everything else to do my own thing. To me, that's phony baloney. No, I wanted to know what the creator had for me. Truth. And that caused a connection. Deep type of reflection to happen. A real search. A real relationship. And real results. That's where the discipline came from. The discipline did not come from trying to obtain something. The discipline came to attempt to be pleasing to my creator. Who just so happens to be my father. And heaven. Once you find that out, you also realize the multiple examples in the Word of God. And you also realize that same Word is built into you. But all of you who read the Bible, you also know there are spiritual things that are not disclosed in the Word of God that are indeed found deep within you. You can't talk about it because it's not Scripture. Though somehow you can confirm something that you never knew before. You have a broader scope of vision, and you're very careful with it, because some people mix that up with imagination, which should not be mixed up. All of it begins with discipline, and discipline truly begins with a solid relationship, and that solid relationship truly begins with identification, and identification truly begins with some incident that forces you to realize that your life is fleeting, and you don't have control over life and death for yourselves. See, because once you let that go, the burden is gone. Once you stop trying to live all the time, once you let that go and realize your father has created you, he will control when he puts you on the shelf. And when you're in use, once you let the Lord deal with that, and you stay away from it, that's when you become somewhat of an explorer an explorer of his righteousness, which helps you build a solid relationship not based on saving your own skin. No. A relationship realizing you have a real father. Now, when you realize you have a real father and you back away from the world, that's when your life blossoms. It doesn't go empty like everybody else. It blossoms. That's when you attempt to tell everybody else there's a place that has enough room for everybody. But I'll say it again, society and mankind is developing just like a baby would in the womb. There always comes a time where prophecy takes place because man goes through various stages of development. Sometimes it's 400 year terms, sometimes more. But they go through stages of development and right now we're at the place where nothing satisfies anybody. This is going to cause something. When nobody is satisfied by what the world is offering, historically, humanity begins to do something very predictable. Very predictable. This is where we're at now. And the earth, likewise, does something very predictable. Remember something, the womb and the baby grow at the same time. Do you guys know that? They develop at the same time. The earth and humanity are doing something at the same time right now. It's inescapable. That relationship, you'll see it if you just look. But it's all part of the same creator that developed how we give life. The same development of humanity is after the same manner of giving birth 
in humanity, the same manner of thing is happening. Why do you think the Lord likened the earth to the woman's womb? Birth pains, right? To the process of giving birth. Because the same one who designed us designed the earth. And the process of this earth is our process also. It's totally tied in together. Now humanity is at a point right now of deliverance. That there's several different stages when you're about to deliver a baby and humanity is in one of them right now. And we're going through it whether people want it or not. We're going to go through it. And so will the womb. You know, when a baby is about to be born, the womb contracts, doesn't it? Birth pains, the contraction of the womb. They get stronger and stronger. Do you not know that our father did the exact same thing to this earth, to the solar system, to everything he created? It's the creator's children are soon to be born. And all existence is coming to witness that. So are all the threats to the birth. They're coming. This stage of prophecy, of time that we're in, is covered quite well in prophecy. And as we go through this transitional period, it will expose quite a bit of a truth of all people. But the earth itself is going to be just like that womb with massive contractions. Massive. And that's why the whole world seemingly erupts at the same time. It's quite amazing, actually, with or without communication, global conflict has been one that's been uh, quite timely. Records match. Continents that had no contact with each other at certain times, they were still fighting at the exact same time. Right? Um, th these turnarounds, as a time in history when things truly transition into from, from going from one category to another, one, one stage of development to another. The whole world has gone through this. And now we're in a time where people cannot be satisfied. They can't. There's no satisfaction, no fulfillment in what they're seeing, which is why they are excited sometimes as they hear a news story or something like that, but it doesn't stay. Unfortunately, this will begin to can you imagine a person who has no relationship with Christ and they can find no fulfillment whatsoever? Now the Lord warned us. He told us about this. In fact, he told us how to combat this. He told us how to overcome this. And so I'm going to tell you guys now, it is, it really is a pursuance of mine that people find it for real, to be contented for real, to have fulfillment for real. So, for example, if everything's shut off and you're just sitting there, you're okay, right? You're okay. You're not empty. How many people have a fear? Now, probably nobody has ever asked you this, but how many people have a fear of the emptiness, the emptiness that you've had hints about throughout your life? A lot of people say, well, they're scared of being alone. What, what, what that truly is, is emptiness. It's an emptiness. And sometimes throughout your life, you get very close to facing that emptiness. And it can scare you. It really can. It's, it's worse than isolation. It's worse than being alone. It's an emptiness. No fulfillment. It's almost being purposeless. If you, when you attain that relationship with Christ for real, you never have to fill up your time with anything anymore. You never have to think about something or go do something to have yourself contented anymore. See, when a relationship is real, you don't need to imagine anything. You don't need to do anything to make it exciting. Do you know that? It, it, even in a real relationship, you don't have to do anything to make that relationship exciting. Because in a real relationship, there is a connection, a bond. Just being near a person in that relationship is fulfillment within itself when it's real. Most, if not all of you know that. Just to have that person in proximity is fulfillment. Because one, you realize how precious that union is. And also there is on a whole different level, there's always the exchange. In a real
real relationship, there's an exchange that cannot be put to words. It cannot be measured by instruments. Nobody's going to articulate it. Many have tried through books of philosophy and have failed. It's an exchange, I personally believe, is of the spirit only. An exchange is quite real. And when you have that exchange, without words, without doing anything, there's a fulfillment there that cannot be explained. That relationship with Christ is attainable. Not just some made up thought relationship with Christ, a real relationship with Christ. Imagine that. It's my desire that people experience that. Because I know that once people experience that real relationship with Christ, that's when the life change comes. I can totally understand how a person would love a relationship with Christ, yet they don't have that connection yet. And so what do you do? You have to act like you're happy or act like you're content. You have to quote scripture, having nothing in return. You're trying to have faith, right? But there's no underlying connection there. I know what that is. I know what it is to try and claim your way into a solid relationship with Christ. It's a real relationship with Christ. You don't claim anything. You're simply you. You're genuine. You begin to see things in a very different level. That's attainable. That's real. The Lord told us what to do to have that attainable relationship. I'll tell you this. It cannot be done by man's prescribed way of living. It has to be done the way that Christ told us it could be done. It takes a genuineness. The instruction comes directly from Christ. And it's quite simple. But most people never do it. Sometimes we're so tied up we're trying to be someone. We can no longer recognize who we are originally. Sometimes we're so tied up in developing a character, we become disconnected from who God made us to be. I'll give you a small hint of something. All of you have a child's passion. A child's passion. A child's passion is something a child will do. And they continue to go back and do it from time to time and they have a real passion behind it. All of you have that. It's important that you remember the passion. Not necessarily the thing, but the passion that you had that nobody interfered with. It was all yours. It, what's unique about that child's passion is that nobody had anything to do with it. Nobody did. It was something that was natural to you. Something you had. You never explained it to anybody. You had a strong desire to do it when you were a child. And it's that desire, that child's desire, you have to remember. Because that was genuine. It was not molded by the world. See, as you grew, the world started to teach you how you could not have things. Anybody notice that? That's what the world does. The world teaches you what you cannot have. The world teaches you the limits. Right? It's like calculus. The world teaches you what you, what's, you know, you can't have this. And it tells you that's in the realm of the imagination. You can't have that. You can't have that. But when you're small, you don't have those limitations. You don't live by those limitations. And so that passion you had, what you had when you were tiny, was quite real. It's a part of your identity. It is something you naturally do something no one has to ever force you into doing. You naturally do that. That genuineness, and that's a genuineness that you have, that's within you. If you can remember it, it can still be cultivated. But it's important that you remember that nobody ever taught you that, that nobody ever tried, nobody strengthened that. It had strength all within itself. That's your God-given passion that was within you. It's natural to you. See, it's still there within you. Life is the one that told you stay away from it life is the thing people in this world discouraged your problems pulled you away from it and everything took place right but it was also your peace now in some way that is a part of your true identity because that was founded in innocence your father made no mistake in who he made you to be and for a long time 
because of the world and what we've been what we did not know we were fighting in the world many of us have become we almost lost ourselves in this world but I'll tell you something there's nothing that this world can do to keep you away from what the Lord has predestined you for you know what that means all of it's coming back that means you will have full deliverance not half deliverance not some professed deliverance not just deliverance by somebody's uh, assessment of you no real absolute deliverance real freedom that means you'll overcome all things in this world all things and it's also important that you don't know how that could ever take place you know why that's important because there's something your father is going to do for you you won't do it for yourself and nobody else is going to do it for you either when it comes to your final deliverance only the messiah can do that for you and it's important that nobody else ever be able to did you know that maybe you didn't think of that one what that means is there are certain things in your life that are not going to be solved by flesh and blood but only by the living god what happens when that takes place all your innocence returns all those things the world tried to disprove that was in you like your compassion your ability to love people beyond their sin your ability to see the good of a person that nobody else can see the good in those type of abilities you had them in a type of innocence when you were young now with maturity with development and God's deliverance it becomes part of who you really are key to how you'll operate because I know I said this a few times in COT I'm going to tell you again there's another step that step is coming that, that step is not something we fulfill it's something we agree to initiate and the Lord fulfills it we're talking about going beyond just appeasement going beyond the average day-to-day -day debates to doctrine going beyond the milk that's all over everywhere going beyond that it's this time that you live in now this will make or break humanity permanent time you know I had an alert when I left there were weather alerts yes on the East Coast but there was a Middle Eastern alert on there too the things that are happening in the Middle East yes they're disturbing but they're also predictable they're also prophesied it's a known fact that people will go against Israel in fact you know wars and desolations are decreed until the end they will happen they are disheartening sometimes and it will consume a lot of life but it is the method by which God will bring all things to a close the process of humanity which is in fact the birthing of the children it's almost complete and it takes these situations in the earth to bring it about the situations overseas to bring it about even in that situation find it in the word of the Lord don't argue about it just find it find it know the importance of Israel not just saying they're God's people because you're God's people now not just saying that but know why the land of Israel why it's such a contentious place to the carnal but what it is what what is it about Israel that God would look down and remember his land and pity the people what is it those things once you know that once a person understands that once it, because it's very easy to understand once you know that and understand that then you'll really be able to see the fight in the Middle East you'll see it all goes back to a spiritual tug of war you'll see why evil does what it does once you see it you won't be surprised but your eyes will be opened to a much broader thing happening darkness by the way in a birthing in, when, when a woman is giving birth to a child you have the doctors you have the nurse you have so what is the bad element that could be in that room anybody know what is the one element that can just make all that be in vain in the deliverance of a child what could be there that can just mess up the whole process anybody know it's not very obvious it's not it's not obvious somebody says pain well pain is a natural part of it pain is a natural part of birth you can't separate the two so pain is a natural part of it what is it though you know it's important when they when they tell a woman to push that's important you guys know what happens if the woman does not push if that woman does not push if they have no tools 
to cut her open and that woman does not push, what happens? See, when it's time to push, it's time to push, correct? It's time to push. And to my understanding, when, it's, when, when that woman is pushing, it is, it is very difficult to push. It's very difficult to push. It's very painful to push. It's almost like telling a woman, induce your own pain. The worst pain you ever had in your life, induce it now. That's what it's like saying, push. And it takes everything to push. But if the woman does not push, what happens to the baby? If a woman were to all of a sudden lose consciousness or something to that, you know that baby could die. So the same effort is the blessing, isn't it? Effort. That woman's effort to push. That woman's effort to push. It is effort. It's not the completion of the push. It is simply the effort of the push. But if the effort is not there, the child could die. If all things were in place, but the effort is not there, the child could die. In our case, you're going through a similar process, right? The earth, things are happening in the earth. Now remember, the earth is the womb. If the earth is the womb, then contractions are normal. Contractions would be these events in the earth. Jesus told us, earthquakes and floods and divers places, these were the beginning of sorrows, right? The wars. But they're just birthing pains. They're indicators of the real push. And if it takes a woman to push, and she has to exert that effort to push to deliver that baby, then we know a push is coming, don't we? A push that if it does not happen, a person could die. Now, the only way to, to die in this case, in humanity's case, is to be separated from the living God, is to not believe. So what is that push? Here it comes. What is that push? You know what a doctor says, push. Push is very important that that woman push, that she utilize every ounce of strength she has to push. It is the hardest thing a woman could ever do because she's already in pain. She's already tired. She's already scared of more pain. And the doctor says, push, push. So let me share this with you. What element in, in for humanity, if humanity does not do it, if they don't push now, they could die. What is it? In fact, if it's not done, it's over. Everything is prepared, but the push is coming. And during that push, if it doesn't happen, it's over. Now the woman has to push in the womb. That's what she does and the baby comes out. So what is the push for us? You ready? I'll tell you, because the hardest thing to do for a woman is the push. Do you know all resistance is against the push? It's against that push. That push is very difficult for a woman. Ladies, is that right? That push is, the, is a horrible thing. Isn't that right? The push takes every ounce of that woman's energy. The push is that impossible thing the woman always says, I can't do it. So what is the push? Push your hands. Your belief. Have you guys noticed oh, you're hitting a brick wall? You, you still have faith. But have you noticed how many things have come to oppose your faith? To attempt to alter your belief? And in every single case, you have to give it an extra push of faith to get beyond it? How many things have come to challenge your belief? I'm telling you now, something is coming to challenge what you believe. It's going to require you to push. If you push, everything's in place but it will require a push. During this push, when you do push, everybody else around you may give up. You hear me on this? Everybody may give up. Everybody may say, what's the use? Your eyes will deceive you most of all. What would you guys do if you saw a person of righteousness healing people at a service and it happened all week and they were preaching in the name of Jesus and they were actually healing people and they were doing miraculous things. And this person again was preaching in the name of Jesus, but then they turn around and tell you that you're just like Christ here on this earth. And that you can start being just like Christ here on this earth now. And telling people to live free now. Just altering things just a little bit. But they were indeed healing. Your language was solid. 
that what people are looking for right now? I tell you it is. I tell you right now, many people would flock to that individual and would follow that individual because they're doing it right now. What did the Lord warn us of? He said, in truth, now this is where we read. I want to show you this. A lot of people think it's the weather phenomena or something like that that's going to get to folks. And no doubt you're going to see quite a bit. I don't want you to see this because the Lord warned us. And if we can somehow find or make a relationship with the Lord solid now, uh, we probably won't go down that line of things that others will. It says in the Bible, he's, it says this, you ready? It talks about the desolation, the abomination of desolation. It says, except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not. Did you hear me? If any man says to you, Here is Christ, or there believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. You know what that means? Something is coming to fulfill scripture by, the, by way of your eyes. You do know that, don't you? Something is coming to fulfill scripture by way of your eyes you know how people argue about the end times and how it's going to unfold and, and some argue how christ is going to return if man ever predicts a christ return i'm not following that christ I'm not i want nothing to do with a messiah who can be found out by mankind whose greatest greatest held back mystery man can resolve are you serious that means man is smarter than that creator that came no thank you plus the word says what's coming are a bunch of imposters that if it were possible they would they would deceive the very elect that can you imagine a spirit filled person that is almost deceived by a figure that fulfills everything of Christ in the human eye. You know what that means? He said, he said, he said, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now we know it's not possible because of God. Here's the troubling part. If God did not break the belief off from those people you see by the eye, even those filled with the Holy Spirit would absolutely believe what they were saying lord have mercy do you hear me? if god does not halt it there's nothing we can do to shield ourselves from it nothing that means we're going to buy it hook line and sinker if god does not intervene we're going to fall for it how does mankind fall for something by weight of evidence they are convinced by weight of evidence. When you are convinced of something by weight of evidence and everything lines up and points and says, that's it, you're going to start believing. The Lord already warned us. We're not to judge by what we see or what we hear, but by righteousness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. See, that's totally different. By righteousness. But that's not what people are doing. We evaluate, and we're doing it spiritually to things that should be earthly. These storms, for example. This hurricane that's forming, right? There are now four high-pressure systems. Now, I can observe that with the eye and see the outcome of this storm. I'm not going to say it now, but I can see the outcome of this storm. I can. It's, it's clear now. Everything formed tonight while I was talking. While I was away, the other high pressure system formed. The modeling is going to change. I know what it's going to do. Right now, I can do that by the eye. I can do that by weight of evidence and trending and everything else. I can even go so far as to agree with some of the spaghetti models that came out there. Right, and I can do that. 
by weight of evidence, by trending, by the sheer volume of data. That's not faith. That's not. That's logic, right? When you have enough evidence that points in one direction, well, then that's it. That's called logic. And what people are doing is they're applying their evaluation of logical things, of these earthbound things, to spiritual things, and that's a mistake. If a person is good all their life, it does not mean they're righteous, does it? If a person is in church and they've never wronged anybody and they bless everybody, it does not mean that person is righteous, does it? doesn't even mean they're a believer, does it? They can have all the evidence in the world, and it does not mean they're righteous, does it? No. There are people right now with the ruins, very special ruins, or let's say... Um, it's an archaeological find will be brought forward and it's going to cause many to stumble many will start to stumble of this one why because the evidence is going to point towards something and they're going to have no choice but to believe the evidence before them they're being primed and trained for it right now everybody is using the scientific method to evaluate just about everything they see they're also trying to evaluate spiritual things through the scientific method, and that's a no-no. When it comes to spiritual things, the scientific method can never apply. It never does apply, and it's never successful in its application of applying. It is never successful. That's a problem. Jesus is telling us that people are going to be deceived because of how they apply and label truth to something. They're doing it through this scientific process. Because everything we do, we're waiting for evidence. We follow the evidence, don't we? Don't we? A lot of people say follow the money. That's evidence. You follow the evidence of things and you come up with a conclusion based on the evidence. See, I'm a sinner saved by grace. So if a person were to actually look on my professional record, they would say that guy's a professional murderer. That's where he is. But that's not who I am. So by weight of evidence, you could come up with a conclusion on who I am, by weight of evidence, but you be blind to who I am spiritually. Now, all of you who have been here at COT for a long time, you have, you have a sense of my character through conversations about Christ, a sense of certain loyalties dealing with faith that they would know by weight of evidence. The times you live in right now, things are all around you, things are being discerned by evidence. Why? Because all the other methods have failed, didn't they? Christians, How many people have predicted when the Lord would come? First, they remember the calendars in the book of Daniel everybody used to use. And they were convinced. They said, look, look, this calendar. This person says, based on this calendar and this, that the Lord, and this will happen on this day. And it failed, didn't it? It failed. And when that failed by calculation, they began to apply other methods. And when that failed, they began to apply archaeology. And when that failed, they began to imply other methods. When all of those methods failed, even the spiritual men, some people got in there and they would calculate things saying that God told them so and so. You guys remember those days when a person would just jump up and say, God told me that the Lord's coming back on such and such a date. And it failed. So in the minds of so many, discernment concerning the times of Christ have failed. So what do they do now? They, start, they started calculating. They are utilizing the scientific method to extract the truth. And then when that solely failed, now they mingle the two, the spiritual and scientific, to attempt to extract the date of the return of Christ. In my opinion, all the date things are going to fail. They're going to fail. That does not mean I discount all those who come up with dates, and I'll tell you why. Because everybody who looks for dates of the return of Christ, they end up finding something else. They end up finding errors. The, the time spans that are actually categorized. They kind of brush over them, yes, but they start finding these time spans that are categorized. They begin to name, like the, like the dragon map. I've heard that recently this week. Do you guys know what the, uh, the dragon's calendar where you have a white dragon and a red dragon, and each has a 500-year reign. These are recognizable things that used to be utilized in ancient history. But they were set up by Nephilim. Nephilim 
were not the bloodthirsty tyrants everybody thinks they are, though the result of their dealings can be bloodthirsty. Right? But these guys, some were giants. Some were men of renown, famous people. Same thing happens today. These things, being in the earth right now, are manipulating quite a bit. But it's a manipulation we were born to live by. The current system that you live by, who do you think developed that? They did. So they're impressing upon people to discern dates and times a very specific way. They're using people to extract these or to get these dates and times. And what will eventually happen is what we just read in Matthew. While people are, they, they, the calculations failed, their prophecies from these various people have failed. Now they have mingled the two. Once another element is applied to it, they're going to have success, but it's going to be a false success. Do you hear me? They're going to have a false success, which means on this earth, you're going to see a bunch of people convinced that the Messiah has returned. But I can already tell you, the returning of the Messiah is going to ignore all the words of the New Testament. And if you're not, if God does not intervene with us, even we would be lost in the songs. We'd believe it too. Why? Because people want closure to everything that's happening. They hunger for closure. Why do you think so many people say, yeah, get it back to what it used to be? It'll never go back to what it used to be. Never. How many times have people tried to make something back what it used to be and it never, ever works that way? It never works. Once something has altered, it can only go forward. It can never go back to what it used to be. It can only go forward. There is no going back. Remember that so that you're not fooled. That's what makes this time so different. And as the earth continues, it's birthing pain changes, very wild changes, as we see right now with these huge storms, right? We thought Katrina was bad. This storm could potentially outpace Katrina in many different ways. All these floods, you know, there are floods in Africa, rivers, and Africa is going to be split into three continents pretty soon. It'll be three specific continents. There's so many things happening right now. It's just incredible. You'll hear about the seven rivers of Egypt. That's going to mess up people's minds. The Mississippi River is going to re reverse its direction. Because of what we do, we're going to lose a whole city in a couple of places. The ground is going to give way. How many people have been having dreams about sinkholes? There's a public warning that is scheduled to go out this week. Um, probably Sunday, maybe it'll go out. Dealing with sinkholes. A public warning. Why? Because they're losing too many people in sinkholes. So we know the earth is altering quickly. We have external problems also. So the problems we have spiritually, people are tuned or let's say changing in accordance with these birthing pains. Because the child is coming. The last push is going to be a push to keep your faith. The fight of your life to keep your faith. The trial of trials to keep your faith. The test of tests to keep your faith. And many, just like you guys are getting a companion, you will have, each one of you is going to be assigned an AI companion. Do you know that? Each one of you is going to be assigned an AI companion. That will essentially become you online. Even the people that don't like it are going to have to have it or they can't do anything. They're not going to be able to do anything. Why is this? I told you guys about... Uh, terroristic threats concerning cyber threats and things of that nature. Now Overwatch has to be employed. They're going to have to watch everybody. is going to have to have some type of personal guardian dealing on the internet. AI is the only thing out there that can actually keep you safe from what's happening online. The 8% of you believers will ask for the companion. You're going to want it positioned. That means a hack is going to be quite devastating. What's coming next is going to be devastating. Hope you guys are ready for that. Most people are not. Most people have no clue it's coming. A hack of all hacks. Keep that in mind because this dark kingdom, which is in place, is going
going to rise at the same time the earth is having these birthing pains. And there will come a push for your faith. So in that time, listen, from right now to that time, your belief in Christ, make it solid. Make it real. You know that your relationship with Christ is real when your joy can outlast everything that goes wrong. I mean real joy. Not fake joy, real joy. Not putting on a smile when you don't want to smile, but to really smile because you're thankful. That kind of joy. That final push is coming. There are many, we know on a birth that they push a lot, right? There have been many, but there's a notable time of that push. Stay locked in with your relationship with Christ. It'll be tested on all levels now. From conflict in the Middle East to the degrading conditions of the earth due to earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. The ash is coming and the sky will seemingly turn on humanity. And humanity itself, they will continue with that internal struggle of power. The storm is going to have a few tricks in it. If you want full storm coverage, you guys have local channels. You know, the Christian community is covering this subject pretty good. It is a serious matter. The pressure systems are pretty strong that have been forming. Two of them have been moved out of the way. I'm looking at natural high pressure systems which form, which are naturally there, right? When these high pressure systems are robust enough, they're, they're standard. If a low pressure system can be overwhelmed by the high pressure system, that's what causes storms of this magnitude to move. If there ever comes a time when the low pressure system overwhelms the high pressure system, we have a problem. We have a big problem. Now, I've been tracking some of these vortices in the high pressure systems within themselves, right? Earlier today, we had a count of five high pressure systems sitting to the west of this storm. So if you take a vertical line and draw it up from the Gulf going straight up, you had high pressure systems dominating that area. The storm itself has developed two low pressure systems, two, two stagnant low pressure systems have been above it for a long time. These were the same two low pressure systems that were over uh, Nebraska and one was over um, you know, close, to, um, close to California some days ago. The very... Um, stern, fast movers, right? And they have a lot of pressure behind them, too. They have joined or triangulated themselves with the hurricane. The hurricane is a cat one right now. And the winds are still starting to spread outward. This storm has moved two of those high pressure systems out of the way. Now, that's not a good indicator as far as the uh, part of the western track of this thing. The western side of this hurricane is going to spin off. That means it's going to spin off tornadoes. That's what that means. Whenever a low pressure system overwhelms any highs that are near it, then the that, that ground turbulence is so, so high that it would actually obliterate the formation of a high pressure system. It's going to start spinning off tornadoes. That's when you have the, the direct wind shears. These hook clouds begin to form. And then you have an issue. You have a problem. I've been watching that just to see where these tornadoes uh, would potentially form and what, what magnitude of rainfall people would really encounter. The end result of this could be one of two things. We could have a stalled system, which means they've been watching it so long because of the movement. The movement and development of this storm has been quite slow. It's been, you know, predictable, but quite slow. In the absence of any high pressure systems, there's nothing to slow this thing down. Right now, we're going to watch and see if those high pressure systems uh, gravitate northern. If they go in a northern direction, it's going to push this storm west. As soon as it hits land, it's going to go directly west if the high pressure systems uh, form. But if they start to drop in a reformation, it could actually push this entire storm system to the east. That means it'll go up the coastline. Right now, with the position of these high-pressure systems, it depends on the development.
right in the center of these two high pressure systems. I'm going to be watching that all night to see in the next, probably about the next six hours to see what the actual formation of that is going to be. Oftentimes they make adjustments in the modeling with uh, the, these um, organic variables, I'm going to say, just like that, they, they'll insert them and uh, to make that adjustment because some things are just observable and calculations uh, often don't work out too much when you're dealing with an organic situation like this. So we're going to see what develops. If that high pressure system forms, then thank God for that. Because it will stall out some of the uh, some of that built up pressure on the western side of this beast and really begin to dry it out. That'll be a blessing. That means we'll still have the high winds, but we won't have that, that sheer number of spin-off tornadic activity that nobody needs. A water event, um, it'll be kind of slowed down too. Temperature is going to be a big factor in this, a huge factor. The Gulf is hot, so it's going to pick up that, um, moist, that moist hot air, utilize that to energize itself. If, if, that's, if that continues, we're going to see some hail, uh, some pretty big hail too. Updrafts will be incredible. Again, if a high pressure system forms, and it overwhelms the ability of the storm to pull out any more energy, we're going to see a dissipation effect, right? Or, or at minimum, we'll see a wall of protection keeping this storm from going into certain parts of the USA, right? That's what we're really looking for. Katrina, in Katrina's formation, when it formed, all the high pressure systems left. They just vanished. When that took place, that storm just, it ripped through everything. It did. Then, of course, out of the blue, a strong high-pressure system formed. It quickly came over the area dissipating uh, Katrina, but after it did its damage. So, if you guys are paying attention to your local forecasts, I hope you have your alerts turned on. This may be a night that you'll have to listen to that, especially if you live on the eastern uh, seaboard. If you're, if you're on the eastern side of the USA, please be attentive to those alerts. All right? Also be attentive to those in the Christian community who spoke about this storm in the first place. Always do that when, when, when God lays something like this on somebody's heart and they stick with the story, right? And it turns out it's pretty accurate. Then do yourself a favor and make sure you keep tabs on what they're tracking. That means the Lord gave them the truth and it did not come from, you know, fear or anything like that. So, stay tuned with those folks. I'm tracking this overall trend because just as, just as we were warning, right? We were warning about the fire in the water when it was still winter. You guys remember that? The, the fire in the water. And the, I used the term hypercanes. Uh, the water, we've seen a lot of water potential. That there, there are certain um, elements of the atmosphere that are changing rapidly. And I'm very concerned about the winter. I mean, extremely concerned about the winter. I know it's a bit premature, but I'm always looking out for what things will turn into. I also see that uh, there are a lot of people who are unaware of these changes in the atmosphere because everybody wants to attribute everything to global warming and they're missing the point. They're missing the point that things are changing. And no matter what humanity does, the earth has gone through these cycles before, and it will go through them again. Except we all know that at some point they're going to escalate to a degree that nobody has ever seen. And I believe this is that time. I believe that you're in the middle of seeing a trending that will break all previous records before it. Biblically, the Bible said, these times we the worst times there ever has been since the earth was or will ever be again. Which means we're going through uh, some changes that are simply life altering. The winter, I don't think people are prepared for some differences that are going to be had. Winter with cold weather is going to introduce moisture. Moisture is going to do something to our soils. It's not going to be good. We, we have a drought right now. There are certain water lines that have dried up 
uh, natural waterways are drying up. If that continues in the winter, and the cold steps in, and the top of the ground is somewhat, you know, colder than normal, as soon as that weather breaks, we're going to have a uh, bad situation of the earth caving in in several different places. There are evacuation points on these continents. In other words, there are big holes in the ground big holes that you can't see where the water was but it's not there anymore that's going to be a problem the dryness will only increase i believe that we'll see drought conditions for at least the next if we go on that long for about 15 years this year took its toll next year is going to be worse much worse the heat factor this year people did uh, they lived through it the start adding degrees to whatever the high was this year is going to break all records next year get ready for all records to be broken this will happen during a time of volcanism that we're just simply not used to that's when the mythos that's when people are going to become desperate begin to do weird things and turn back to fables you know in the bible i was just reading the other day that during these in times men would turn back to worshiping demons as gods they return back to to fables again to the ancient tales be careful of that too be careful it looks neat you know these 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 finds are neat uh they they, they really do do something to the imagination They're interesting but be careful with them please be careful with them because a lot of people are going to lose their salvation because of these doctrines and people are turning back to these doctrines because they speak more into the scientific realm than anything else please be careful with that be careful it will attack these things that are coming will they're designed they're birthing things yes but the lord warned us it will be a direct assault upon our faith now we all know the lord tries us by way of our faith he tries us and what that means is God allows these situations to happen without intervention. It's going to try us. We're going to need our absolute clearest mindset in the times ahead. And hopefully that begins now. Somebody says, sinkholes, hell enlarging itself, my husband's comment. You know what I believe? I, I, I know that seems like it's uh, attractive, but I want to explain something. I don't believe hell is a dimension that's escapable. Why would God make a place that demons could just escape from that would indicate a flaw in our father's design of a prison would it not I'm, so i can't i don't subscribe to that part i think these holes in the earth are simply holes in the earth they're part of the expansion of the whole earth due to external gravitational pulls due to internal pressure buildups continental drift the change of these continents is going to be expensive but it will happen. We will absolutely happen. Even Canada will have its break from the USA in certain parts because of geological forces. So, dealing with this storm again, guys. With this storm again. Again, if we have the development of a high-pressure system in this right spot, and I'm watching it very closely, it's going to shift this whole storm to the east. That will be a blessing. It'll simply diffuse the whole thing. Now, it does not mean that everybody's going to be wrong in their forecasts. It just means that we had a reprieve and thank God for that. I don't know about you, but I hate to see people suffer from water damage to their properties, right? From tornadoes and floods and things of that nature. And I am praying for those folks who are in the path of this storm. This is a big one. It's a big one. And tomorrow is going to be, it's going to give us a lot of uh, clarity on what it has a true potential to do. I just pray that uh, people are safe, that people have evacuated places they told to evacuate, and that after it's all over to realize this is one of a few that we may have still yet. It's after this one there could come two more that do the exact same thing. So yes, I'm praying, but also know that things like this are going to happen. I pray that you guys are safe. I do. Now let's jump to the Middle East, shall we? As they decide the outcome of Israel by way of the UN and meetings, pressure on Israel. 
have you guys you guys should have learned that as we discussed a long time ago there is an Iranian a confirmed Iranian hit on President Trump do you guys know that did you guys hear that they finally gave that to the public but they also told you now I can't repeat it because I'll sound like a broken record but uh, uh, was it a week ago does anybody remember what I said a week ago anybody remember I said something specifically about Iran a week ago dealing with Trump I told you they would say it I told you when they said that what was next now I can't repeat it right now I can't repeat it but it was when they did exactly what uh, the guy from the bushes said they would do so hopefully you were paying attention to the rest now what that means is they have how many desperate people do we have in the USA lots how many people who are unhinged do they have in the USA people who would surely take up their position and allow this to happen we're going to have a lot of those Benjamin and Yahoo's on the list too he's out there too he's on there big time so if you guys think of somebody remembers good you remember because it's going to be a very serious matter and at that point people are going to start losing their civility and hope I, I, it's a shame to say but they will and when that takes place there, there are going to be a lot of people who are inconsolable they will become implacable at that point and things will be further divided with violence this time I wouldn't be surprised if large amounts of people would start getting prepared for civil unrest I wouldn't be surprised but we live in fast changing times and at some point this is going to take its direct toll upon all who are engaged in politics well now you know Will those hits be successful? A lot of people out there, folks. Well, let's put it this way. The folks who do the abduction of, of little girls and women are the same people who would also attempt to take Iran up on its offer to go after Trump. We know what's been happening. We know that the abduction rate has been going up. Right? These, these sick people, deranged folks, who are snatching women to involve them in things that are horrible. Those same people would gladly take a couple of million dollars to attempt to oust President Trump. We already know that. We know that number is going to build. So if you guys are ready for that, hope you guys are ready for that. Hope you guys really understand how serious this is. Also, Or you think it's a one-sided thing, you mark my words. There are going to be some losses on the other side. Not the Republican side, but the other side. There are going to be some losses. And hear me on this. I don't wish for either side to do this, but they will. They're going to say it was staged. They're going to say this will inflame the opposite side. Because people forget we're in a transitional phase of biblical proportion. Prophecy is coming to pass. This is the last generation. People are involved in something much bigger than themselves. This is, in fact, the birth of humanity, the birth of the children of the living God, the final transition. And all of what's happening is for that transition, for the birth. But imagine waking up and the unthinkable has taken place. That'd be awful, wouldn't it? All right. Well, you folks now know that that your faith is uh, solid hopefully your direction is clear and I really do hope and you begin to push push to keep your faith to keep it in alignment with the words of the living God not because of evidence it's that internal confirmation your father gave you from the beginning the ministers protests in New York were saying that Israel can go to AG double hockey sticks and anyone not stopping by or trying to stop Israel is dead. Yes, they're telling the truth. It's over here now. We how many how many um of those individuals who are loyal to the Middle East? There are hundreds of thousands of them here in the USA. Keep in mind the USA is about assimilation, building by way of assimilation. But many of the folks who come into this country now they don't assimilate. They replicate. 
their own culture. Remember that. Should that continue, it will begin to wear down the resolve. I'm praying that uh, mercies be upon those who are in the path of this storm. That people remember they have a responsibility from the Lord. You know, in Revelation it says, When they behold the beast that was, that is not, but yet is, they will wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. That's a very important scripture. Let me go there in Revelation real quick. Imagine something coming forward so devastating that people would say, what in the world? Okay, it says, we read it to you guys. Here it is, Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they, do it, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Follow this. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Imagine that. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is, that's like saying when you behold something that used to exist, does not exist today, yet its influence exists. Imagine an artifact that's so undeniable that people would question their origins based on that artifact. Imagine that. Anyway, there's that answer. Right, there's that answer. So they're going to wonder if they were even human in the first place. To wonder if your name was never in the book of life is to wonder if you're part of that inherited race of humans or not. Something so shocking, so straightforward, so believable will be shown. And it's going to cause everybody of faith to take a step back. Imagine that. All right, who's next? Let's see. He tells more about the companion and doesn't have any connection to the glasses. Oh, the AI companion. Well, it's going to have. Um, have you guys? Have you guys ever had the bone, the uh, headsets with no ear pieces in them, where your bones activate and you can hear a phone call? Have you ever heard of those? They don't have speakers. You put them over the. They, they go right above your ear, onto your skull, and when you have a phone call. Right? Your skull vibrates. You can actually hear someone talking. Well, they have a more directed way to utilize that technology with a little tab. It's like a little sticker. And the same thing happens. It's placed on your temple. The same thing happens. You can actually hear with clarity. Um, you know, people in a conference call. Say you were in a conference call and somebody was to your left. Now, this is a conference call. They're on the phone. But with this device, they have position. So somebody could sound like they're in front of you. Somebody could sound like they're the front left of you. Somebody could sound like they're behind you. Somebody could sound like they're, they're to the right of you. You know, it just keeps on and on and on like that. That's with a tab. Now, suppose that same tab had its own onboard comp uh, companion. I'm sure they worked something out on the uh, casing of that, but it's going to be essentially just like that. That's what's coming. It's coming and quickly, too. Somebody said it sounds creepy and weird. Well, right now it does. I can guarantee you that people will be used to it, just like just like people thought that the computer was creepy and weird. Just like they thought a, a smartphone was creepy and weird, right? Everybody has smartphones now, don't they? They do. Just like people did not like the idea of music being on an SD card. Now people can see it no other way. What I'm telling you is that these strange changes are only strange until they are completely accepted, normalized. And so the phenomenon that takes place is by way of mass approval. Have you guys ever seen that word? If somebody does not know what something is, they immediately turn to whatever reference they have. And they begin to accept it based off that reference what's happening the companion will build up and utilize this AI but it's going to build up and utilize all aspects of peripherals that we would have attached to us close to us whatever the case is and all of this is going to come about because of hacking there is some instruction for this uh, I don't know what to call it uh, a cyber maybe a cyber hurricane 
cyber tornado, whatever you want to call it, that will sweep through and mess up a lot of people's things. People will ask for their companion. They're going to ask for it. And then once the companion is out, a lot of you, now listen to me, don't get offended by this, but a lot of you are going to get very used to using it. People that are lonely by themselves, they're going to find themselves fully occupied by their companion. But it says, I already, already have a companion in the Holy Spirit. That's right. But you have a lot of people that don't. They don't have faith like we do. All right. Somebody says, so as, somebody says, so what is that? So as Christians, are we to deny the companion? Well, no, because your companion is just like your cell phone. It's a tool. Just a tool. That's all. You don't have to renounce anything to have that to us. Just a tool. Just a tool. And somebody said, I'm alone, but never use Alexa. This is not Alexa. This would be like you talking directly to me. The smoothness of AI is going to shock you guys. It's going to shock. Somebody said, question where the batteries, propane fuel start exploding like you warned. Um, like lithium. The glass batteries are not like lithium. Nothing like lithium. Um, but I do believe there's a odd effect with technology in the way it's employed sometimes. But we'll cover that in the future. Anyway, this this thing, this companion, is uh, surprisingly a, a pretty useful tool. And without the companion, you will not be able to access bank accounts. You won't be able to go into anything. If there, if the companion cannot get uh, going there, you won't either. So if you guys are ready for that, if we're all ready for this thing. Somebody said, uh, somebody has a question, let me see. Somebody said, Jesus, uh-oh, let me go back. Jesus is at the temple where some guy says they were not born of fornication, which Jesus responds, they are not of the Father. How could they not be born of fornication. Let's see, that was uh, John chapter 8, 41. Let's go look. John 8, 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. What was the question? Somebody said, how could they not be born of fornication? Well, that means you come from a sanctioned marriage, not fornication. Not fooling around with someone. It just simply means they're saying that they were born in a decent household. So they weren't born of, you know, sin. See that now? You guys see that? Okay, somebody says, can you explain the reason why Jesus quoted Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a fulfillment of scripture. When he said that, uh, Walt. Actually, it was said he would do, if you, it, see, here's, here's the issue. When they removed certain books from the Bible, the answers are in those books. They're in the books. That was a naturally known thing that he was that the that the real Messiah would come and quote that scripture. Upon his death he would do that. But then he said that because he took on the sins of the world. The Father, our Father in heaven, does not look upon those things. He would not see the sin that Christ took on to himself. Because if he did, you got to remember something. God is so pure that if he looks upon sin, right, that sin is going to be utterly destroyed. It's going to be utterly destroyed. So think of our Father as, 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 as incredibly righteous and powerful that if people look upon us with the sinful nation, the sinful nature we had upon us, we would be destroyed in a heartbeat just by him looking at us. And that would happen for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. And so instead of that happening, he looks through his son. Thank you, Lord. Listen, th this is very important. Darkness did not come in with the UN. That's not when darkness came in. Darkness came in at the beginning in Genesis. The kingdoms of the earth save for the kingdom God anointed all those kingdoms are under Satan's charge. They have been under Satan's charge. People have convinced people of the holiness of 
this place and that place when we should have listened to our father all along. That makes sense? The kingdoms of this world have been in darkness. They are in fact darkness themselves. Ran by Lucifer. We read about that last night. The king of Babylon. You guys remember that? Lucifer. Remember something. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Why? Because he is the word of God made flesh. So what is prophecy? Prophecy is the word of God. The words of our father. A false prophet is somebody who speaks what the father did not speak for example in the book of ezekiel when when he said that um, pastors would speak something he said they would speak something i did not speak they would tell the people it's going to get better and god said he spoke no such thing he said they were speaking out of their own spirits they're not speaking what i have spoken this is, this is recorded in the book of ezekiel so then a, a, a person who speaks out of their own spirit is not speaking by the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the word of God made flesh. So then prophecy itself is what God has decreed. Prophecy is not fortune telling. Prophecy is not God saying, I foresee in the future so and so will happen. No, God is telling us what he's going to do. You see that? He's telling us what he's going to do. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy is God telling us what he is going to do. He's not saying that, oh, I foresee this happening. And this happens because of this. Nope, there is no because. God is saying, I will do this. And I will do that. Just like the seals. Just like the four horsemen. The four horsemen don't do a thing. They didn't do a thing until Jesus came and open the seals and even that wouldn't have happened until the lamb came and the lamb had to be the lamb God declared everything so God's declarations are prophecy prophecy is not guessing wishing or hoping prophecy is a decree from the Almighty I don't have to take an axe which is a tool and use it to chop somebody's head off I didn't make the axe somebody else did but I can utilize that tool to chop wood to keep people warm. I can utilize that tool for things to aid in the better lifestyle of others. So we can choose how we use the tools. We do not have to utilize tools the way that mankind does. Certainly not like these greedy corporations. These, these companies can sometimes be so greedy they will always go after the money. In fact, if they saw a baby in the street and money on the other side they would let the baby die and go get the money or they would go run over the baby to get the money that's how greedy they are that they keep focusing on the um, you know the prospect of things that greed has gotten in the way of the heart they don't have a heart they have a they have a little plan behind everything they do and that plan is to get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier which drives them to do what they do And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. 